Hello, I'm Candace Roberts. I'm the chair of the board for Historic Gloria Day. We are in Historic Gloria Day Church today, filming our first Great Talks at Gloria Day. We have been doing this uh, in person pre-COVID, uh, but today we have our masks uh, for when we can't be socially distant, and we are recording uh, in accordance with uh, guidelines uh, from the CDC. Gloria Day is indeed a gem in Philadelphia, but we can only have 25 people in here at one time until restrictions are lifted. So this is why we have converted uh, our lecture series into a conference series. So our guest speaker today is Jim Murphy. Jim is a published author. Uh, he is also a member of the Philadelphia Association of Tour Guides and he has been studying William Penn for many years, writing about William Penn, talking about William Penn, and this is a fascinating lecture that we're going to hear next. Uh, I, we will be placing Jim's bio on the webpage where we will be posting the video so you can learn more details. Jim, I love um, plugs wherever we can have them. Jim is also uh, helps small businesses and nonprofits with marketing and public relations work. So Jim Murphy, Welcome to Gloria Day. No shaking hands, so hello. <laughs> and thank you all very much. Thank you very much. And welcome to William Penn time. We're here today to talk about the amazing success of William Penn and how he turned a howling wilderness into America's fastest growing city. And most people don't know that, and we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. I also ask people, am I crazy to tell Philadelphians about William Penn? But I found even when I spoke to the tour guides, I learned a lot of things that they didn't know and I hope that will be the same with you. A special thank you to Gloria Day. This, by the way, is the only church I've ever been in where there are two ships coming up the center aisle hanging over your head. But I would have put them here too, or models, because these people came, I think it was 4,100 nautical miles on these little ships to get here. So we're thankful everybody did get here. Now, a note about Gloria Day that George Boudreau, the historian who wrote Independence, said this is probably the only surviving building William Penn ever set foot in. And if you haven't been to Gloria Day, I suggest you come because it's definitely worth a trip. So, Back to William Penn. His big challenge to basically develop 45,000 square miles of territory. That's what Charles II granted him. And uh, he, uh, Penn himself felt he could make it into the seed of a nation. And if you think about it, between Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, we were the seed of the United States. So William Penn was pretty right on. The big story about Penn and Philadelphia, and most people do not know this, that we started 58 years after New York City and 52 years after Boston. And by around 1770, we were the largest, most important, most cultured city in America. And that was due to William Penn. Uh, it's almost as if New York and Boston would have qualified as members of AARP the American Association of Retired People, because they were eligible. Um, and we blew right past them. And New Yorkers don't know that and don't like to hear that, but it's true. William Penn's fingerprints are all over this city. And people don't know who started New York City or Boston or many of the other cities in the country, but we know who started this city. And you're gonna find by the end of this how much William Penn influenced Philadelphia and the U.S. I usually ask this in person, but I'm going to ask you how many of you are familiar with William Penn? A lot? A little bit? In the middle. Most people are a little bit or in the middle. And I ask this because there are a lot of myths and misinformation about Penn that we're going to clarify today. We were like, Philadelphia was like on Miracle Pro. William Penn himself said one time that in seven years his colony had grown as much as many did in 40. And he was absolutely correct. 
uh, and it was due to a lot of things that William did. And we were the most important city and we were the largest city that uh, George Washington ever saw. By the way, when Washington got here, the first thing he did on his first visit was to go shopping because everybody loved to shop in Philadelphia. We had everything. And Penn was the reason for the growth that we had. On my tour, I talk about our two superstars, Penn and Ben, because Penn set everything up and then Ben came in and made everything better. Between the two of them, they made us enormously successful, but it all started with William Penn. And you're gonna see an out of this world photo later on and you're gonna see, here are some things that you've never heard of before. And I'm gonna share a memory aid with you that I think you will use every day if you're a Philadelphia resident. First, the Jeopardy question. Who is on top of City Hall? Many people will tell you it's Ben Franklin. It's not, it is William Penn. On Double Jeopardy, the person who answered the question said Sir William Pitt. Not a bad answer, but wrong. But it isn't Ben on top, and William Penn is underappreciated and underknown. Uh, in Philadelphia, there used to be week-long celebrations in honor of William Penn, and now people don't pay any attention to him at all, and it's a shame. He was a visionary, and his idea to make this a holy experiment and let anyone who wanted come to his colony and practice their religion was a game changer. Even the Liberty Bell was brought here by the State Assembly in honor of the Charter of Privileges that William Penn gave to the city. And that was it outlined his responsibilities and our responsibilities. And so even the Liberty Bell has a link to William Penn. I'm interested in him for a number of reasons. I learned about him as a tour guide. We have a lot of lectures, seminars, presentations. But most important, I walked by Welcome Park one day, which is right across from uh, City Tavern on 2nd Street, and I thought it was another uh, Ben Franklin payoff, and it wasn't. And I love Franklin, but everything is about Franklin. I realized that this was all about William Penn. It's an understated park, and it's a little unusual but it has a wealth of information there if you want to learn about it. And Thomas Jefferson, by the way, called William Penn the greatest lawgiver the world has produced. So that's pretty high praise. This is Welcome Park, and that is a statue of William Penn, similar to the one on top of City Hall. And on his left, his left hand rests on uh, the Charter of Privileges, which is sitting on top of a piece of wood which is to signify his green country town. My background, I've done about 55 columns on Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, and a lot of them on William Penn, and I'm an amateur historian. I don't know everything there is about William Penn, but I, I've learned a lot and I continue to learn every day. And a lot of my stories are soon to be in a book by Temple University Press, and I have the cover right here. It won't be out for another year, but if anybody wants to send me an email at the end of this and get on a waiting list, I'll let you know when it comes out. I also organized two Billy Penn celebrations, one at Welcome Park and one at City Hall. The one at City Hall was really fun because we had the Quaker City String Band track people into the courtyard, and we had all kind of international visitors looking up William Penn on, their, on Google to see who he was. So, when you get people in the right frame of mind in the right place, uh, they do want to learn. Interesting oddities, and I like to do interesting oddities and fascinating facts. Penn lived here less than four years. People are amazed. He had this impact, and he was almost not here at all. He really wanted his city down at Chester because he wanted to be as close to the sea as he could. He didn't want problems with other landowners, with, with people trying to tax boats coming up the river, but he couldn't get the land he wanted there, so he came here. And he did pay people for their property. When the people in Upland weren't ready, weren't willing, he came to Philadelphia, and he made, I think, the better choice. You'll notice there are no walls around the city, unlike Wall Street in, in New York, and I don't know where the walls are in Boston, but I know they're there. There were none here because ahead of time he said, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna treat the Native Americans well and we'll have good harmonious relationships, and we did. 
Some people say it took him seven years to get his grant. Some people say it took a couple months. Nobody knows the truth. It was a good move for the king and for Philadelphia because the king got rid of the Quakers who were a giant pain to him and William Penn got his land over here and got a debt paid off. So it worked out both ways. How many people here are long-term Philadelphians? Because if you've been here for a while, you'll know why Philadelphians used to have a really bad reputation. And I think it's because of this kind of thing. This was in the 1970s and it was a big ad campaign. Philadelphia isn't as bad as Philadelphians say it is. In reading history, I never understood why we had this reputation until I saw a lecture by Thomas Keels on the sesquicentennial. We had some great celebrations before we were 150. At our 100th anniversary, we had one of the most successful world fairs ever. Or before that, we had the Sanitary Commission, which helped the Civil War. But in the sesquicentennial, 1926, we bombed. And Thomas Keels talks about why. It was supposed to be held at the, on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. Politics got involved. John Wanamaker, who was promoting it, died. And it ended up in South Philadelphia because the politi politicians down there wanted it to not only pave the city, but to help their pig farm business. They were trash collectors. Anyway, it was a complete disaster. And a lot of our, our reputation came from that event. But we came back up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we're pretty far back now. Here are some of the recent kudos for Philly. I think it's this year, best, uh, best trips to take in 2020 by National Geographic. People aren't traveling this year, so that's not going to happen. But keep it in mind when you can travel, because it is the place to go. We had 45 million visitors last year. We won't hit that this year. But we probably will head back for it next year. The thing I am most happy about, because I'm not a Dallas Cowboy fan, when we had the NFL draft here, we had more people than anyone had had before, and we had more people than Dallas had the year after when they held it on the parking lot. So take that, Dallas. My goals today are to have some fun, tell you some interesting things, and give you a better appreciation for William Penn and what he did here. We have about 300 years of history to cover in 35 or so minutes, 30 minutes, so I'm going to move fairly quickly. This is what got me started on my presentation. I was waiting for a tour group from Mumbai, and I was looking over the city, and I said, what was it like when William Penn got here? And I always heard that William Penn bought some farmland and created a city. Not quite the way it went, and we'll show why. William Penn was a planner, a promoter, and he was passionate about religious freedom. But I have to tell you, he also was a slave owner. And I always try to work that in so people don't say I'm gilding the lily. I did a tour last year, and like 30 seconds in, this woman said, you didn't talk about the slaves. And I said, well, let me, let me set the, the whole pattern first, and I'll talk about it. And he did have slaves, and so did everybody else, including Washington. Franklin had them, but later changed. It, he was a man of his time. It was wrong, but that's the way it was. He was a planner. He laid out a plan that has now become listed among the civil engineering landmarks of the country, up along with the Panama Canal, the Hoover Dam, and the Golden Gate Bridge. So that's how important his plan was. And he was a fabulous promoter. If you've ever been in England in the wintertime and you realize how cold and dark it is, you realize how good a wordsmith William Penn was. He said we were 600 miles closer to the sun. We had the latitude, of, we were near the latitude of Naples. You could just see the people in England saying, let me get there. Plus we had all these pubs, we had great meals, great um, game everywhere. We had everything. But he sent these letters out to bring people to Pennsylvania, and they came. He was very passionate about human rights and civil rights and religious rights. He was persecuted remarkably in London, and 
he wanted people to be able to practice their religion. But he also pushed for a trial by jury, amendments to his constitution, and here in Philadelphia, there were only two crimes punishable by death. In London, there were 200. So he made a lot of changes here. And he didn't just talk. He went to jail many, many, many times. And he had an idea for a United Nations of Europe. And you realize why he would. When he was growing up, everybody was killing everyone. Spain, France, Germany, England, Portugal, whom I miss. Everybody warred Russia word with everybody. He realized there had to be a better way and came up with a plan that basically is similar to the United Nations. So he was way ahead of his time. I had a Chinese group last year, uh, young students from the Philadelphia area, um, and as I was walking up 4th Street, they all started chattering and I asked them why, and they kept looking at all these churches. We went by Old Pine Church, St. Peter's Church, St. Mary's Church, I'm trying to go what else, right over there we had a um, a society home synagogue, and they just didn't understand why all the churches. And I said, because of William Penn. Um, there is a, you, you can see here the number of churches that started here. If you walk around Philadelphia, and this is a listing, there are over 15 or 16 that are part of the Philadelphia congregations. And you'll see signs like this. One side will talk about the congregations, the other side will talk about the individual church, but you'll notice them all over, and those are due to William Penn. Now, back to William Penn, the planner. You've probably seen this somewhere, and that is Center Square. That's where City Hall is right now. This is Franklin Square, this is Washington Square, this is Rittenhouse Square, and Logan Square. He set up his city with four smaller neighborhood um, squares and center square which was 10 or 12 acres the others were eight or ten I'm, i might be off too i forget right now but center square was the largest and that's where he expected public buildings to be okay this was the plan he wanted a 10,000 acre city he couldn't get it he could get it way in the northeast but he couldn't get it in chester where he wanted it he tried to get it here and all we have now in his original city are 1280 acres but it worked. His two major streets, High Street, or now Market, and Broad, were 100 feet wide, far wider than anything in London in the 1660s. He had a grid system. We don't have these byways that you have in Europe, and you, have in, you had in New York for a while, and you have in Boston. You have squares. You know where you're going, you know, and it's easy to find things. Um, he also did that because he wanted to sell property. And he was selling property from London in the beginning, I mean, from England. He was trying to get people to come here, but pay ahead of time and come and get their property. You will, if you get to Welcome Park, you will see a, a large map, kind of a map uh, laid out uh, in Welcome Park. The east-west streets now are named after trees that grew spontaneously in Philadelphia and most of them, you know, walnut, locust, spruce, pine. Um, some of them have changed. The Arch Street used to be uh, Mulberry. Uh, Race Street used to be Sassafras, but they used to race carts there, I believe from City Hall over, and so people called it Race Street. And I'm gonna show you why Arch Street. If you, if you notice this bridge here, that is Front Street. This used to be called Sassafras, or Mulberry, I'm sorry, but because they put this arched bridge over it, they called it Arch Street. The embankment in Philadelphia ran from 10 or 15 feet up to 50 feet high, so that's what you see along there where the, the ladders are. That was the seawall uh, of Philadelphia. Penn wanted a green country town that would never be burnt and always be wholesome, and people wonder why. Well, it's still green today, but it's green for a reason. In 1665 and 1666, England suffered much worse than we're suffering in Philadelphia right now. First, they had a plague that killed 100,000 people in 1665. The following year, they had the Great Fire of London that destroyed four-fifths of the walled city. So Penn, when he laid out his city, wanted 
wide lots. He wanted eight, uh, orchards. He wanted gardens. He wanted space between the homes so there wouldn't be fires and possibly disease would not be rampant. And that's the reason um, he laid it out that way. What did Penn start with? Well, many people say it was farmland and it could have been like this, but much more likely it was like this. 300 years of Philadelphia history talks about all the hardwood in Philadelphia. Francis Daniel Pastorius talks about the howling wilderness in Philadelphia. He said when he landed a year after William Penn, there were four small buildings near Dock Creek where Penn landed. That was it. Um, Pastorius had a friend, a baker, that he was friendly with and he liked to get his ba baked goods. He couldn't find him again. He lived around 2nd or 3rd and Chestnut Street, the great baker. Pastorius lived over near Front and South and he couldn't find his way back. That's how much of a howling wilderness it was. So Penn had to cut this city out of uh, tree by tree. And from that he developed the fastest growing city in the colonies. And I want to show you this picture because this is mo one of the most important pictures in the country ever. It's the first picture we have of a city in, in, the, in the New World. And it was done in 1720 by Peter Cooper. It didn't surface until 1860-something in, in London in a, a curiosity shop trash bin. And one of the Lords of Parliament, members of Parliament, gave it to George Mifflin Dallas, who was a politician here and for whom Dallas, Texas, may have been named. He sent it to the Library um, Company of Pennsylvania. You'll see he even has something like 24 places mentioned in this legend. And if you look all the way to the left at the bottom, you'll see a, picture, a self picture of the artist. And up here you have William Penn's coat of, coat of arms. And somewhere you have the, I think that's the, the seal of the city. But this didn't surface for a, a, a couple hundred years, but it shows you how built up Philadelphia was even by 1720. And it grew into this world-class city and a world heritage city. We were the first in the United States to get that distinction. He also was very lucky. He, lay, he put it between two rivers and that worked out great for a number of reasons. Um, one is the Schuylkill River, once we found coal up there, all that coal came down the Schuylkill River before we had the railroads. And he, has, he ended up with the largest freshwater port in the world for many years. That port runs from Trenton to Philadelphia to Wilmington, and it was an enormously successful port. He also found a uh, clay deposit, and that's where we were able to build our houses of brick and not wood and keep fire down. And he also wanted to use the trees that were all over here to build ships, which we did. Um, and eventually we became the workshop of the world. So he was lucky and he also was right in a lot of things he did. He really envisioned more of a suburban town. This is a slight exaggeration, but he really wanted, again, large acreage, big homes, and he offered big homeowners lots in Philadelphia and then also huge plantations, if you want to call them that, out in the suburbs. And he also wanted rents. He wanted wide streets. And again, he wanted you to be able to fight fires. He wanted you to be able to traverse the city without being cramped in. But by 1700, there were nine alleyways that ran from Front to Second Street. And Alfred's Alley, uh, Jeremiah Alfred never lived on it, but he owned property there. But these tiny alleys are all over Philadelphia now. They went against Penn's plan, but everybody stayed along the river because that's where the jobs were. That's, that was all, it was like our super highway. This was a quote that I saw in the New York Times years ago, and I love it, and I'm not going to read it to you because if you can see it, you'll get it. But it's true, anywhere you walk in Philadelphia, especially around here, downtown Society Hill area, uh, Queen Village, you'll find little walkways and garden ways that you had no idea we were there. He also left us a, a city of many nationalities. And again, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of this just so you get that 
when this man dined here, there were Scots, English, Dutch, Germans, and Irish, Roman Catholics, churchmen, Presbyterians, Quakers, New Light men, Methodists, Seventh-day men, Moravians, Anabaptists, and one Jew. This was our legacy. We had all kind of people living here. And Pennsylvania is still packed with trees. Surprisingly, even today, 58 to 55 percent of the state is covered by forest. In the Northeast Meadowlands, that's amazing. And yet, he wanted to call it New Wales. He wanted to call it Sylvania, and the, the king said, no, it's Pennsylvania after your father. When Penn came here on the welcome, 30 people had already died on the trip. And because he had had smallpox as a child, he was able to minister to them. For several years after they landed here, most half of these people lived in caves that were built into the seawall. And he landed at the Blue Anchor Tavern. If you know where Society Hill Towers are, it's right near that. And he even changed the law. I won't go into detail because we don't have that much time, but the story of the Bushnell, Bushel trial, or it's also called the Penn Mead trial, if you read it, it's like the Defenders used to be on TV. Penn was arrested for preaching uh, Quakerism, and uh, the jury wouldn't convict them, so they threw the jury in jail. And they were in jail for a while, and Penn appealed that and won, and that case is one of the most important cases in both English and American history, and Scott Turow, the crime writer, he wrote about that in, I think, 1999, said it's one of the most important things ever happened. So Penn did a lot of important things no one knows about. His oddest honor, Camp William Penn, was named for him, a pacifist and a Quaker. It just seems like a, an unusual oddity. Um, and the other thing is, there's a statue of William Penn in front of Pennsylvania in the hospital. That statue was supposed to be something tiny, uh, and it ended up being this giant statue that they had to find a place to put. Penn's big problem was his boundaries. Philadelphia may actually have been in Maryland. So he had to run back to England after being here only two years to defend his, his city. Eventually, the, the, it was ruled that it was part of Pennsylvania, but it was touch and go for quite a while. The boundary was finally settled by the Mason-Dixon line, and the Mason-Dixon line started here in Philadelphia. They started their line here. They went 50 miles south, and then they spread that line east and west, and that's what ended up being the line between the North and South in the Civil War. And it, uh, it started, the survey started right under where this pedestrian bridge is. Major events that happened. We had giant yellow fever epidemic in 1793 where one-tenth uh, of the citizens were killed. So we know what it's like to have a pandemic or an epidemic. We established a quarantine center on the Delaware River so that when people came up the river, they couldn't get here until we had checked them out. Uh, we had waterworks built in order to try to clean our water. Uh, just so you know, we also had nativist riots here. And as a result, because people would burn churches and run a block north or a block south and be out of the city, we consolidated the city in 1854 and went from two square miles to 130 square miles overnight. And then eventually we became the workshop of the world. The beautiful waterworks is still worth a visit. Um, and, it, and for many years, it's why our water was pristine. It changed later, but it, it kept us safe for a long time. It wasn't in place during the uh, epidemic of 1793. Yellow fever killed 10% of the people. This is a Lazar the Lazaretto, and if you've not ever been to it on the Delaware River, I suggest you go. It is being turned into um, a historic site by um, Tinicum Township, and they've, sit they've put some offices in there. It's certainly worth a visit. And you still feel like it's 1793 when you look outside. Eventually, the city politics moved uh, westward, and eventually ended up with Independence Hall or the State House at Fifth and Chestnut Street. They wanted to move City Hall to Independence Square. This shows you what that would have looked like. City Hall is gargantuan. 
That's Independence Hall on the right in the circle, and that's City Hall on the left. Fortunately, that did not happen. Moving further west, we went, this is City Hall. We pulled everything west to Center Square, but west of that, we had these giant railroad tracks, and we couldn't go anywhere. We called it the Chinese Wall because they said that's what it looked like, the, the, Chinese, the Great Wall of China. Eventually, we took that down after this burned down. This was the Pennsylvania Railroad, the largest railroad station in the country, and some say the world. Penn Center went up along that road, and now that's a beautiful part of Philadelphia. Um, Independence Hall um, was not always treasure. We were going to get rid of it. Uh, core heads prevailed, and we kept the city bought it. But in, uh, in, in during the um, Civil War, uh, slaves were brought back and, and put on the second floor of, city of Independence Hall while they waited for their trial, and their trials weren't very good, fair trials. So it was an independence for everybody. Uh, but that's a great book on Independence Hall by Charlotte Meyer, Charlotte Meyer. Uh, this is a change to the city that was dramatic. Um, there was a thing called the, the City Beautiful Movement in 1893. As a result, we built the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, which ended around 19, I'm going to say 29 or 30. It is a magnificent mile. We were going to build another one, but we, we, didn't, we couldn't go through the industrial area. Um, the Curse of Billy Penn. After we built higher than Billy Penn, Billy Penn was 548 feet high. Once we built higher, we never won another championship, and people called it the Curse of Billy Penn. Later, we put a little statue of, bell, of buildings that went ahead of, above Billy Penn, and now we've won championships. But they, they, they have little statues of Billy Penn in the, the, two, um, the, two, the Comcast building and the new um, Comcast technology building. I'm going to quickly go through these. Um, these are little known uh, facts that we did have caves in the ground, as I mentioned. Uh, we had two islands that were in the Delaware River that we have since taken out. But in the early days, you had to cut, you had the, the passenger boats had to go right through this island in the middle. And that's a great reference book. Our top exports were our Philadelphia Waterworks that went all over uh, the country. We were the first to realize clean water was important. At one point, um, our water bills were reduced from something like $400 to $2 a day when we put water wheels in. We went backwards in technology and we gained efficiency. Eastern State Penitentiary is our most copied building. It's a fairly sinister looking building from the outside, but what made it important was if you look in the middle here, um, a guard could stand in the center of that and see seven cell blocks by just turning around. That building has been repeated 300 times, including, I know, St. Petersburg, Russia, and other places. Market Street. No one had a Market Street until we did, and we didn't call it Market Street until years later, but everybody referred to it as Market Street. And William Penn wanted a market. He put it along Market Street, what is now Market Street, it ran eight or ten blocks, but it also jumped across Broad Street. There were other blocks there, and then everybody started putting in markets. So we are known as Market Street, um, and it, as I said, it was officially named it years after uh, it became Market Street. San Francisco has a Market Street that's 20 feet wider. They said they wanted to be bigger than Philadelphia. They're now making that a pedestrian-only street because it's too big, so maybe Penn had it right. And this was a quote um, from John Adams that there were so many people along Market Street. And even the bus shelter at front of Market is made to look like an old market. Independence Hall is a great book. Uh, other great Philadelphia exports, uh, Stetson and Hats were known all over the country and they were made here. Baldwin made 70,000 locomotives here. And the Saturday Evening Post came out of here and Godey's Ladies Book was the most expensive magazine of its kind, and it was enormously popular. So we had a lot of different names, we had a lot of guts, we had a lot of hubris, and we did some great things. Um, we had the second highest attendance in any World's Fair uh, in 1876. A um, couple big Philadelphia numbers. One in six Philadelphia doctors has been trained here. Um, the City Hall clocks are bigger than Big Ben's. ENIAC was started at Penn, 
and the barcode was invented at Drexel. So within a mile, we have two of the most important inventions for the last hundred years. Quick quiz, does the city hall clock have Roman or Arabic numbers on it? Doesn't have any at all, <laughs> which I didn't know. You ask almost anybody and they'll tell you it's one or the other. Now, much more serious matters. Who's on the Quaker Oats package? Quaker Oats said it was just a Quaker, but it, was in, it, it meant integrity, honor, and purity, honesty and purity. You'll see the Quaker there. They have a thinner Quaker here. They say it's a man in Quaker garb, but we found an ad that says, here you see the picture of William Penn. And that came from Bob Skiba, the head of the Philadelphia Tour Guides for a number of years, and that's what he found. So it was William Penn on Quaker Oats. And that's a woman who has done more to promote William Penn than anyone I know. Her name is Elaine Peden. She spent $10,000 of her own money in three years to try to get William and Hannah Penn named honorary citizens of the U.S., and she did it. Back to William Penn. He had a sad end. He was betrayed by a fellow Quaker. He ended up in debtor's prison, and then he had a stroke, and he deserved better. But he still stands above his city with the tallest statue that we know of uh, on top of a building in the world. And his city is growing at all times. Four great sources, Philadelphia Encyclopedia, HiddenCityPhiladelphia.org, Hidden City History Making Productions, and the Philadelphia History Blog. And this is a new biography, not by a relative of mine, but it's by Andrew Murphy, and definitely worth it. That's a view unlike any I've ever seen. That is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from a satellite in, I think it was 2013. And it's amazing to me, it seems naive, but it looks just like the map, and it does. Here's your special bonus. I'm gonna give you an easy way to remember your streets in Philadelphia. I went to the market to buy some chestnuts. Changed my mind, I bought some walnuts. Chased by a locust, I ran from spruce to pine into a lumber yard. South of it, standing on a bridge, I saw a girl, uh, a bridge over the water. I saw a girl named Catherine. She was a Christian and her father was a carpenter in the Washington Federal Army. So that'll get you about 12 or 1300 blocks south of market. It's an easy way to remember Philadelphia streets. Um, please spread the word about our founder. If you have any questions, let me know. And please donate to Gloria Day Church. I know the flame is Historic Preservation Gloria Day. Please make a donation. There is a dip jar here that I was going to make a donation to, but I will make it before the end of the night. Please do the same. And I, I, each one of you who uh, we have an email address for will get a, a copy of a William Penn story and a, a copy of the street names of Philadelphia. Thank you so much, Jim. That was fascinating. And I feel like we need to have you come back again for the part that you kind of zipped through. Um, those of you who watch this broadcast and share uh, in the Q&A with us, please uh, send us an email if you like this format because our historian, Amy Grant, has many wonderful speakers lined up. And if this is an effective way to have our lectures till we can all be in Gloria Day together again, uh, and hopefully that will be sometime in 2021, uh, but uh, should it be not, let us know if you like this format. And thank you so much. And again, um, we didn't set up the dip jar for tonight, but do, uh, do consider a donation uh, through our website. It's very easy. Click on the donate button. So thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jeanette Ware, the historian and archivist for Gloria Day Old Sweets Church in Philadelphia. We are very fortunate to have in our uh, collection an artifact that dates back to the founding of the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm thrilled to share the item with you today. But first, a little history. The Swedes arrived in the Delaware Valley in 1638 and quickly began settling in the area. Our first church was dedicated on September the 4th 1646 in Tinicum. By 1677, the services were held in the blockhouse at Wicico, less than half a mile from where William Penn would develop the city of Philadelphia in 1682. When Penn received the land grant for Pennsylvania, 
He was determined to build a city where all religious faiths could worship freely, despite being under English rule. As such, Penn embraced the Swedish Lutheran as well as others who predated his arrival. During his time in Pennsylvania, Penn and the Reverend Andreas Rudman, rector of Glory Day, soon became well acquainted. Rudman helped build Glory Day Church, the brick building that still stands today, only feet from the original blockhouse. It is said that Penn attended the consecration ceremony in 1700. The Swedes and others who were not born in any part of the English realm were soon given the opportunity to become naturalized Englishmen. In 1701, Pastor Andreas Rudman became a naturalized citizen, and this is the certificate he received, which was signed by Governor William Penn. Thanks to a grant from the Swedish Colonial Society, we were able to restore the certificate in 2019 and it will soon be on display at the Lazaretta in Essington as part of an art exhibit that will be open to the public. Hello again, I'm, it's a beautiful day after we just filmed our first Great Talks of Gloria Day and we can hear the traffic but I thought I would like to show you where your donation dollars are going to. If you take a look up here, you see the woodwork is uh, definitely needing repair and painting. And so we secured a Keystone grant last year uh, where we provide 50% of the matching funds and the state of Pennsylvania uh, gives us the other 50%. And we're going to be, uh, hopefully this uh, later in the month, start the repair and painting project of the church and some work over on Riverside Hall and a bit on the Sexton House. So uh, you can actually see where your dollars are being spent and we're being very conscientious about how we spend your dollars. So I do hope that you will hit that donate button and uh, come visit us when you can. The grounds are open 24 seven. The church is open a bit during the day, but it will be increasingly open as the pandemic subsides. We don't know when that will be. So, uh, but definitely the grounds are always open. So please come by. Thank you. So I, we're getting a bunch of questions in, but I know that there are a couple of points that you wanted to clarify. Oh, you know what, you guys, I should introduce myself. I'm Amy Grant. I am the Corporate Secretary for the Historic Gloria Day Preservation Corporation, and I will be moderating the Q&A. So please send your questions uh, into the chat window, and Jim will be happy to answer them. So Thank you. Jim, go ahead. So I know there are a couple of things that you wanted to clarify from right. uh, the video. So do you want to do that first, and then I'll... I'll uh, bring these questions up. Please. Um, yes. One, I noticed just now that I said Library Company of Pennsylvania. It's the Library Company of Philadelphia, and it's the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So I made a mistake there. Uh, on the Pennsylvania Hospital um, gift, the Pennsylvania Hospital expected a painting, and they were asked, where will the painting go when John Penn, the grandson of William Penn, was to send it? And they picked a location and sent a note back. And then the next thing they know, they get this giant statue delivered uh, that had nothing to do with the painting. So uh, it appears that Ben Franklin had seen this statue in 1775, sent a note back and said, this is really great. The, uh, the nobleman who owned the statue didn't particularly like the pens and he sent it to a junk shop and John Penn found it there and sent it. So it's a, an involved story, but uh, that's how the statue got here. Um, that's so interesting, especially because it, Penn had nothing to do with setting up Pennsylvania Hospital, right? Right, right. Yeah. But they, I think, I, in fact, Franklin wanted it to go to the State House or Independence Hall, but somehow it came to Pennsylvania Hospital. <laughs> History is weird sometimes. Um, <laughs> there is. One I was telling Amy the other day, um, the first fake news story that I know involved William Penn. And if you go to the New York Times and put in Cotton Mather and William Penn, you will get a 1907 article saying that Cotton Mather was trying to kidnap William Penn. And I think he was going to send him to the uh, to Barbados uh, uh, to be a, to make the whole ship full of slaves. It was an editor, a publisher in Easton, Pennsylvania, who did this. 
I have no idea why, and it's been thoroughly debunked over the years, but the story still keeps coming up. So Penn was even involved in fake news. Um, one person asked that I read the quote again. Is that right, or do you want me to just send them the quote? Why don't you read it um, again, and we can also include it in our follow-up email. Okay. Because it's really interesting. Um, it, this is the visiting Scotsman. Yes, that's correct. Uh, he was a Scottish-born physician from, Na from Annapolis, Maryland, and he said, I dined at a tavern with a very mixed company of different nations and religions. There were Scots, English, Dutch, Germans, and Irish. There were Roman Catholics, churchmen, Presbyterians, Quakers, New Light men, Methodists, Seventh-day men, Moravians, Anabaptists, and one Jew. That's the culture that William Penn left us the legacy that he left us. That's pretty amazing. So you ready for some questions? Sure. Okay. And if here's... I can answer them, I will. If I can't, I'll say I don't know. Okay. Here's the first one. Is there any evidence left of the caves? So I'm, I'm assuming that this question is referring to uh, when, when people, when William Penn and everybody first arrived here, they lived in caves under the um, uh, at Delaware they were, River. They were Harry Kiriakotis, Codis, who wrote, um, he's written several books about Philadelphia. One, I think, is The Lost Waterfront. He says that on Front Street, there are some of the cellars there were in the original caves all the way back to 1682. They turned them into something else, but there is evidence evidently along Front Street. Um, and as you go up, if you walk up Front Street north of Market and go up a couple blocks, you will see the only remaining stairway that William Penn had built about every block so that everybody could get to the top of the seawall sea wall, and they had access to the port. So right near where that, there, and there's a historic uh, sign there, right near that are some of the homes I believe that Harry Kiriakotis was talking about. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, here's the next question. What was the debt that Penn was owed by the king? There are a lot of different stories on that, but Admiral William Penn put a lot of money up to help the king fight his wars. And I think he paid some of the men that, uh, that were on his ship. So supposedly there were, and the numbers changed. I've heard 11,000 pounds that with interest became 16,000 pounds, but that's what was supposedly the debt Penn was owed. Whether he really was owed that or the king wanted to get rid of the Quakers, and I understand there were about 60,000 of them in England, either he really did owe the debt or he took this as an opportunity to both pay a debt and get rid of Quakers who he didn't want in his country. Okay. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. You mentioned the ships hanging in the church. Do you know the names of the ships Penn arrived on? and? What year did he first arrive? Penn arrived on the Welcome, W-E-L-C-O-M-E, -E, and uh, that was in 1682, October of 1682. Okay. Did William Penn ever venture out of Philadelphia? His land grant was so vast, did he ever attempt to tour his vastness? I know that I was supposed to be at a program in Gap, Pennsylvania this year in, on July 4th that was canceled. And there's evidence that he was out there and had land out there. Um, Penn was a traveler. I mean, he went all over Europe half the time he walked or I don't know, but he seems to have walked everywhere. He traveled a great distance. So I would assume he got to a lot of his territory because he also was trying to sell property. We we do know that he he went to Chester County, right? right. Because that's where the part, the Swedish settlement was in part there, and he went to visit the grist mill, and um, and as you mentioned in your talk, he tried to uh, to buy land over there, and it didn't work out for a number of reasons. So so we know he got around a little bit, and I would think he got around. Well, he was only here four years, so how much can you do in four years when when most of the time you're either trying to set your government up or fighting with Maryland to try to keep your city. So so this, okay, this was one of my questions and I'm sorry guys, I'm taking over, but um, you mentioned that Penn was only here four years. Was that four consecutive years or were those was that multiple trips and four years total? 
it was two trips, four years total. He was here 1682 to 1684, and he was here 1699 to 1701. And that was it. He ran back to England to try to make sure he could get keep Philadelphia in Pennsylvania and not in Maryland. And that fight went on for a long time. But then he, he had a lot of things to do in court, and he kind of lost control of his colony being away from 1694 till 1699. I'm yeah, I'm sorry, 1684. 16, wait a minute, 1684. He left and he was back 1699. So he was gone what 15 years. Right, and who who acted as governor in his place? Do you remember during that time? I believe that James Logan was. Well, there were a number of governors. James Logan was his right hand man there were a number of governors and there were there were a lot of disputes between the quakers uh and and pan i mean it was it was not smooth running and it's particularly hard to to handle a colony from three four thousand miles away five thousand miles away with no with no communication yeah that definitely had to be a challenge so here's a here's another question aside from ben and pen what made why uh, Philly grow to the largest city in the New World and not New York City or Boston? Well, it was a lot of things. It was one that he invited everyone here. We were called the best poor man's country, um, that we were hell on politicians and uh, preachers, and we were not taxed. We didn't pay a, a, a tithe for religion tax, which they did in a number of the colonies. I don't remember exactly how many, but I believe at least more than half you paid a tithe to to the official religion. We didn't have that. We brought a, a lot of artisans came here because even in 1681, before Penn got here, he wrote how he was going to handle his market. And he wanted artisans to be able to make money in the market. And in the the numbers of the first five years here, something like 30 percent of the people who came were artisans they weren't all farmers they may have been rich landowners but many of them were artisans and they added a lot to his city and to his market which became the equal in many people's eyes of the markets in london and paris very quickly okay was the relationship between William Penn and what i'm sorry let me start that over what was the relationship between William Penn and his grandfather why was the state named after the grandfather? Well, I'm sorry, it's his father, not not grandfather. It was Admiral William Penn. It was named after because he was the man that Charles II had a lot of faith in. He helped actually, I think he was on the ship that went and got Charles II restored to power. You had the Charles I was beheaded, Parliament took over, and then Cromwell took over. And the kings, I think Penn actually brought the king back. He was friendly with the king and he had helped him in a number of wars. That's why he wanted it named after Sir Admiral William Penn. Okay. Did Penn have a family during those four years? Wife and how many children? Did he also have a son named William Penn? He had a son named William Penn, who, if I can be blunt, was a bit of a bum. He had about 18 children along the way with two wives, uh, and I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the children, but William Penn was junior, was sent over here to try to get himself under control and to try to give him a, a, uh, a stepping stone to leadership. He did a lot of drinking. He got in a fight. I think he punched out a constable when they were drunk at a bar and he was sent home and he spent a lot of money that Penn didn't have at the time. After, after Penn remarried and his second wife was here for a short time, two years, and then governed it from England, um, William Penn Jr. and sued to, to become the power of Pennsylvania, to get Pennsylvania as his and all the money from William Penn's uh, estate. Uh, he didn't get it. Um, and while there were, there were, I think eight children lived, you know, out of infancy. Um, there are no direct 
William Penn living descendants that I know of. There are third or fourth or fifth or eighth cousins, but there were no direct William Penn descendants from what I have read. Okay. Um, so uh, William Penn's second wife was Hannah Cowell Hill. Is that correct? Yes. So just um, this is just an aside. The day after we filmed the lecture inside the church, uh, Pensbury Manor released a. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. Go ahead. Well, they uh, Pensbury Manor and BillyPenn.com had a big story about all the slaves that were at Pensbury Manor. I had read along the way that there were three or seven. I had never seen detailed what came out of that. Um, the picture they painted of Hannah was not very good. And that's the first time I've ever heard that, where um, a fam I think a family was split up because she didn't think the slave was doing the job. There was, there was a nasty comment in it. Um, and I didn't realize Penn had had that many slaves. I had not ever seen that before. Uh, but it looks like they have a research project going at Pensbury Manor and they are finding more about that. Again, I tell people William Penn was a man of his time. I wish he hadn't been uh, because slavery is the most despicable thing that's ever happened to our country or anywhere. And uh, he was a part of it. Uh, and it was a bigger part, it looks like, than I had realized. Again, I always say to people, let's look at a person's complete picture, not not any one part of it. And when you look at all the good that Penn did, it helps a little bit counterbalance some of the, the bad. So so one other thing before I go back to the, the questions that are coming in. Um, when So during Penn's four years here, uh, he lived multiple places, right? He lived at Pennsylvania Manor for a short time, but then he also lived at uh, is it Second and Walnut, where Welcome Park is now. Is, wasn't that the Slate Root House? Yes. Yeah, so that's why that park is there in that location. It is, and that's where John Penn, who was the only one born, one of his children born in America, and they call him the American, John Penn was born in that house. And Penn also reportedly wrote the Charter of Privileges there, and the Charter of Privileges is the document that says this is the rights of the, of the governor of the governed, and this is the right of the governor or the of the politic of the. This is these are Pennsylvania's rights. These are your rights, and uh, he set out a government of that he hoped would be good people doing good things. We've had some of that. And we've also had a lot of history of violence and rob and riots and and other things. Um, so you get what you get. He he put out a wide net and he brought a lot of people here who um, were very vocal in their opinions. I had a I've asked Jim Mundy from um, um, you call it um, on on Broad Street. Uh, the um, I lose it. It, it. The bill it was started to help link the Union League. I've yeah. asked Jim Mundy at the Union League if Pennsylvania had to vote, would we have voted for the South or the North? And he has told me it'd be very close. We had a lot of abolitionists in Philadelphia, but then we burned down a number of places that the abolitionists put up. So we were a violent society, and we were a mixed bag, and we are today. So here's a, another question. Uh, when did we become the Keystone State? I'm not sure. Um, I know when you look at a map, we are we are like a Keystone would be in an arch, uh, but I don't remember when it, it became known as that. Okay, here's a, another uh, William Penn family question. Did his daughter Letitia live here or did she go back to England? We have Letitia Court and also some land near Valley Forge that she supposedly owned. I believe she lived here for a while because there was she had a home near Market Street, and I think there was also Letitia's court. I believe she went back, but I haven't done a lot of research into the family because um, I, this is where I think it's dangerous for people to write too much. William Penn wrote in um, I think it was Solitude or. Uh, he wrote in something about what it's like, what parents should be. And when you look at what his children did, especially his children came back and basically cheated the Indians out of their territory. I mean, William Penn and the Indians had a wonderful relationship. And um, Tamanin said, we will be, we will love William Penn as long as, long as the rivers 
rise, uh, I'm sorry, as the rivers run and the, and the sun will rise or the moon will rise, his sons cheated the Indians out of land uh, by telling them that there had been a, a treaty that had never occurred that they had not written down, but the, that they had signed, quote, signed. And then we cheated them out of amount of territory the size of Rhode Island. So um, his sons did not learn well from him. Uh, and so I don't have a lot of time for his family. So I don't look into it very much. Well, I did. I'm embarrassed to admit earlier today, I did go to the uh, Wikipedia page on Letitia and I glanced at it quickly. I was looking for something else. And uh, and what you say is what it's on Wikipedia about, um, about where she lived. Um, was there ever an attempt from Penn to obtain the land near Wilmington, Delaware for Pennsylvania, extending the southeastern border? Well, Penn, when he got here, wanted access to the sea and he wanted to be as close to it as he could so he worked he worked a deal with the duke of york who owned what we call the the three lower counties or what are the counties of delaware and he he had them in his i mean he ruled them uh after a while the the the, the counties in delaware um what they became, they took themselves out from under his rule. I don't remember exactly how they did it, but it got so bad that in the 1740s, they wanted to tax every boat, come, every ship coming up the river because we didn't have um, security in Pennsylvania and they wanted to tax and, and start a uh, some kind of a security force. That's just what Penn didn't want for any reason because he had seen problems in New Jersey with people on on borders and he did not want to be taxed but he did rule those three lower counties in addition to his 45,000 square miles of territory so he had a lot of property um can you talk about Penn Treaty Park I can in fact Elaine Peden who is the woman I mentioned briefly at the end she got the statue of William Penn that uh, placed in Penn Treaty Park. Mm -hmm. uh, Penn Treaty Park, we don't know that the treaty really took place there. It may have, nobody is sure, but William Penn's statue points to the Northeast because um, the um, John MacArthur, the, the builder, wanted it him pointing that way toward Penn Treaty Park. Alexander Calder did not, he wanted it paint facing directly south because the profile would have looked better in in a longer sun but we have him facing north to Penn Treaty Park because there's a belief that that's where William Penn signed a treaty with Tamanand and or some of the other Indians nobody knows for sure if it really took place there but we now have the statue of Penn there because the daughters of the American Revolution I think it was or it might have been an earlier group had paid $35,000 for the statue and Philadelphia would not allow it in Fairmount Park because one of the members of the art commission had been a student at PAFA who had known the sculpture and didn't want his sculpture in Philadelphia. So it didn't go to Fairmount Park and eventually Elaine was able to get it in Penn Treaty Park. Ah, that's interesting. What, was Penn a developer in England? If not, what was his profession? He was a law, I mean, he studied law, he was a writer, he was, a, basically he, he wrote and agitated because once he became a Quaker, he also was called on to adjudicate uh, problems. In fact, he, earlier, he was involved in New Jersey, uh, West, uh, I think it was East or West New Jersey. He was brought in to solve problems there between some disputing Quakers, and he got some land in the corporation as a result. But that's partly where he started, I believe, thinking about, oh, maybe this is a place I can set up Quakers in a territory that I uh, that I organize and rule, and that we can have um, this uh, um, poly, uh, poly experiment. Okay. I would also like to know about the walking purchase and how built the, how Penn built the state too. The walking purchase is part of what I was referring to about 
the cheating of the Indians, and it involved James Logan and John Penn, and I think Richard Penn. They convinced the Indians that they had signed a treaty that said, and this is mostly the, I think it's the Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania. It's north, north of here toward the Wilkes-Barre area, if, I, if I'm right. The deal was as far as a man could walk in, uh, I think it was 24 hours, um, that's how much territory they could, the pens could get. Again, this is a phony deal, but this is what they ex told them they had signed. They had a, a team of runners who ran and went far, far beyond what the Indians ever thought. They felt completely uh, cheated and uh, never felt the same way, I don't think, about the pens again. They did about William because he did treat them as honestly as he could, but not about any of the other pens. They, they were just out for money and out for land. Why was the land in Chester too expensive and who was selling it? The land was too expensive because there were a lot of Swedes that had been there, had been established there and didn't particularly want to give up their waterfront area. Penn was not happy with this decision. He had sent his, um, I think it was Markham, he had sent three commissioners and they were trying to work the deal with the Swedes and the Swedes weren't having it. I think Penn felt that he could have sweet talked them. I don't really believe he could have, but he was never happy that he couldn't get that land. But I think he did much better where he ended up with his city of Philadelphia anyway. What has impressed you most about Penn? I think his interest in trying to do right. He didn't always do right. Obviously, he had slaves. He I think in the back of his mind, he knew that the Indians were not going to be able to keep all their land. Once the Europeans started flocking here, it was hard to, to separate the Indian land from, from the land of all the people coming in who didn't think the Indians were doing anything with it. There is a, an interesting book um, called Peaceable Kingdom Lost, and it's pretty terrifying, but it's how... Uh, we massacred the Indians massacred some of the settlers. We massacred some of the Indian women and children that were being protected by the state uh, because they wanted the land. It it became a battle. The French and Indian War is where everything changed because the French had some of the Indians on their side. The Indians had some of the. I'm sorry, the English had some on their side, and then we had settlers who were coming through who just wanted the land. So. It was a devastating time. It was the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, and it was terrible for Pennsylvania. Well, uh, it looks like you've answered all the questions that have come in. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to add? To uh... Only thing I forgot to mention was that uh, Pastorius, um, who was the founder of Germantown, um, he was the one who called this a howling wilderness. And Penn had, uh, Pastorius had a tiny hut in 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 one of the the mud, I'll call them one of the mud huts or one of the huts along the river, and he put a sign up that said, "A little house, but a friend to the good. Remain at a distance, ye profane." And he said William Penn laughed when he saw it, and Penn didn't laugh a lot, but they said he did enjoy that. And he and Pastorius communicated a lot, traveled together, and communicated in French because they both knew French and it worked for them. Um, but it's another, and he's the one who couldn't find his baker in Philadelphia. That's right. So um, one of the things that, uh, so Jim and I used to work on a, another project together um, for Queen Village Neighbors Association. We were both editors of the uh, neighborhood newsletter, which was like a glossy magazine. And uh, one of the articles that Jim wrote for that magazine was about Pastorius, and we learned that there used to be a historic marker uh, in front of the place where Pastorius lived, which is basically Front and Naudane, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, we found a photograph of it even. It's the old style of marker. It was a plaque that was um, put into the side of a brick wall. Well, that brick wall no longer exists. The building that was there has been long torn down and there are, a, string of modern-ish row homes in that space now, but it's a real shame that that marker is missing. And um, 
If anybody has any interest in this kind of thing, uh, it's pretty easy to get a marker restored um, that's already been approved. So uh, if that's something you're interested, we can share that information, but it, it just seems like a real shame. That's such a, a part of our early, very early history that people will walk by those houses today and, um, and have no idea that that's where Pastorius lived, that William Penn visited him there. And, and this, these are the people who uh, helped build and develop our city. So we've got one more question. Didn't Penn want to originally settle at the Pennypack Creek and the Delaware? To my knowledge, no, but he may have. I don't, all I know is that he went up to Pennsbury Manor and used to come down by boat. Um, I don't know about the, the Pennypack Creek. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know about that either. Um, if the person who submitted the question uh, knows more about it, please share that information with us. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Um, all right, well, thank you all so much for joining us for this program. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning. For some reason, the video wasn't playing for everybody. It was playing for apparently 50% of you, so we restarted, and I apologize for those who had to see the first couple of minutes all over again. There's apparently no way to scrub forward uh, in, when doing this kind of uh, webinar. Um, but we are very interested to hear what you thought about this program, if you liked the formats, uh, because I have a bunch of other speakers lined up and, and normally this lecture series would take place inside Gloria Day Church and we would go into Riverside Hall after and have some drinks and some food, but we can't do that right now. So we're still trying to find a way to connect and share all these great stories and please let us know. Oh, wait a minute. Oh my goodness. There are a bunch more questions. Okay, hold on. Uh, where is William Penn buried? If known, can it be viewed? He is buried in England. Um, yes. I'm Go on to... findagrave.com and uh, type his name in, and you will see a photo of his gravestone. I don't remember exactly where it is. That's something else I ran into today, by the way, <laughs> for uh, for reasons I'm not going to get into. But um, it wasn't I wasn't preparing for this talk. I just was curious. And yes, you can still see it. One at one addition there, and that Elaine Peden who did so much for William Penn here. She got the idea to make him an honorary citizen when she visited his grave there and started to put up a flag. And they said, we don't put flags up here. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, but they gave her some sod and said, if you make him an honorary citizen, maybe we'll think about it. That's when she came back and spent years. But she also said, and she likes to tell this to school kids, that William Penn had two wives, Guillaume, however you pronounce it, the first wife, and then Hannah, they they told her at the at the gravesite that Hannah's on top. So <laughs> she, uh, she thought that was funny, and the school kids did too. Oh, that's funny. Well, of course, it's because you know when you bury, you bury on top um, within the same plot. So, but that's still well. Yeah, Hannah died after, so she <laughs> she would be on top, right? Um, so the, one of the reasons, and I, I'm just going to mention this for those. Uh, you were interested, uh, for those who are interested, um, one of the reasons why I, today I was looking at various websites like Wikipedia and um, the Welcome Collection and uh, Find a Grave is because uh, Jim has written up uh, his William Penn story and we're going to be publishing a short edition of Founders Magazine with that particular story. So I, I was actually looking for supporting images to create a timeline and things like that. That's why, that's why I was saying, oh, I was looking at this stuff today. but. Um, so we'll be uh, we'll be getting that ready soon. And again, we can include uh, a link to the online version of it um, when it comes out. So uh, if you aren't already on our mailing list, uh, it would be great if you could subscribe because we once a month we send out an email that's got a little history story, uh, a featured marker, a featured gravestone at Gloria Day, and then information about our upcoming programs. So uh, so please go to our website and subscribe. And uh, as this program ends, um, a little survey is going to pop up, and it would be really great if you um, if you could fill that out and let us know what you thought of this program, what worked, what didn't work. We'd really like to uh, continue this format if you all like it and improve the technology, <laughs> because obviously we had some glitches today. So uh, thank you very much. You can also email us if you'd like 
Uh, if you have any questions for Jim or, or if you don't, you prefer email over a survey, our, our email address is preserveoldsuites at gmail.com and our website is preserveoldsuites.org. So, so please visit. We've got a lot of good fun stuff on there. We've got a podcast. We've got an interactive map of the of the churchyard and a bunch of history articles. So, so stop by, sign up for our newsletter. Um, one other thing, oh yes, and donate. <laughs> and uh, one other thing that um, we'd like to mention, uh, because Gloria Day uh, Old Sweets Church and its graveyard are actually in the middle of a national park, our grounds are open very often <laughs> during the day and it's a great time to stop by and just explore. We've got um, at the front door to the church, on the right, there are some paper maps. If you prefer paper that will that list all of the uh, visible markers in the churchyard. So if you're looking for a specific person and their marker is still there or a remnant of the marker, you'll be able to find them. Uh, the, on our website, we have an interactive version of that map. And we are we've got all of the visible markers there now, but we're slowly adding in the locations where we know Someone was buried, but there may not be a marker. That way, if you're looking for an ancestor or someone specific, you can at least find the plot. <laughs> so anyways, uh, thank you all so much for joining us. And um, please give us that feedback. And hopefully, we'll see you at a future program. Take care. Bye.